Arvin's going to stand up and just give his spiel. And let me tell you, when I sat down with him at Panera Bread and listened to it, it was intense. Didn't write any notes down and I just looked at him and listened. I want you to do the same thing because you're going to learn something. All right? <laughs> So clearly I'm an engineer, so if I screw up, don't be hard on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, as uh, Dr. Rob uh, introduced, I'm uh, Arvin Thiruvengam. I'm a research assistant professor at the Mechanical Medicine Department. Uh, I was a project lead on the, on the Volkswagen study, and we never expected this was going to become this big. So, now before I start off, you know, there was some <clears throat> interesting uh, discussions you guys were having, and you know, a couple of questions that I wanted to ask, maybe you guys <coughs> just, you know, do a show of hands. How many of us really go to a car dealer to buy a car and are expecting clean emissions? You know, it, it, is that a criteria? How much of how many of you guys look for clean emissions before you buy a car? I see two. I mean, <laughs> that, that's that's true. I mean, even you know, being a mechanical engineer, I go into a dealership. I look for fuel economy. I look for all the amenities the car is going to give. You know, the economics and stuff like that. And um, you, you know, even even gasoline. Gasoline has. Um, these uh, categories like ULEV and PZEV. ULEV is ultra low emissions vehicle. PZEV is partially zero emissions vehicle. If you don't go into a dealership and say, I don't know, I'm going to pick a ULEV today, you know, it's never the case. ULEV is probably the worst vehicle out there. I mean, in terms of what you get in the vehicle. So, um, so you know, from, from that uh, perspective, let me just go, and go ahead and tell you what we did uh, from the, for the Volkswagen study. Um, when the study started out, it was not uh, meant to um, pick on a manufacturer, so it was a very neutral study. The way it started out was uh, the European um, Commission, it's called the Joint Research Commission, it's the regulatory body of, the, of Europe. Um, they, they had done some um, preliminary work in um, Ispra, Milan, and Rome, where they kind of observed high emissions from similar manufacturers, mostly the European manufacturers that they were, you know, they were selling uh, diesel vehicles um, in Europe. Because diesel population in Europe is significant. It's not like in the US. I mean, the US is less than a percent. Um, so so when, they, when they found that, and they found that, OK, the same manufacturer makes cars in the US also. And the US is, has the most stringent emission regulations on this planet. So what they wanted to do was, you know, let's go, to, let's go and test some of these cars in the US, prove that it's clean in the US, and then you know, put the uh, pressure on the European regulators to make them clean in, in Europe. You know, that's how it started, ironically. And then uh, it came to us, and it was, a, you know, it was a routine project for us where we do emissions. You know, we've been doing this for like 15, 20 years now for uh, heavy duty trucks. It was the first time that uh, you know, we got an opportunity to do for passenger cars. So we thought it was a great opportunity, so we bid for it. And um, you know, we, we kind of offered the most amount of data for the small amount of money that was there. It was less than 70000 actually $50,000 uh, project. Um, so you know, initially, our plan was to pick a vehicle, drive it across the uh, United States from Morgantown to um, Riverside, California, so we can get through you know, many different cities, many different geographical conditions, like go over the Rockies, you know, get the altitude effects and stuff like that. So it, that was our grand plan. But we were never able to get a vehicle um, on the East Coast. We, I tried um, contacting uh, Volkswagen directly. Actually, it went to the, uh, the environmental division, Stuart Johnson, who is in charge of the uh, emissions regulations for Volkswagen in, in North America. And um, they said at that point it was too small of a project for them to um, shed their resources on. So, you know, as a result, um, we looked for cars and we found California had a, a we had a lot, of, lot more options in California because there were rental agencies which were focused on renting out diesel vehicles. Uh, there were uh, these exotic car rentals where, you know, you could get the high-end uh, diesel vehicles. The other, the other problem that we had was most of the diesel vehicles, except the Volkswagen, were all high-end. You know, the Audi Q7s, the Mercedes, uh, the BMW X5s. So, you know, we had to find a rental agency that, that kind of uh, caters to those uh, segments. Obviously, Hertz and Enterprise weren't going to cut it. And um, so, um, so we kind of tweaked the test plan to, to do the study completely in, uh, in California, which was, which was good because California has unique problems because of their air quality issues. Their emissions regulations are an order of magnitude stricter 
than the U.S. So they have a, you know, it's like a special country for, the, uh, for us. <laughs> you know, people, you know, mo when, when the first the diesels came into the U.S., they were not 50 state compliant. You know, they, they were, they were, they can sell the vehicle everywhere other than California because the manufacturers could not meet California regulations. 2009, Volkswagen TDI was the first one to meet California regulations. And then followed by Mercedes. I mean, Mercedes blue tech diesel technology was, was far more advanced at that point than Volkswagen, uh, Volkswagen's technology, but they still couldn't meet California regulations. Um, so Volkswagen started off with their TDI uh, with 50 state compliance, then their Passat came in, and then you know, uh, BMW and, uh, and uh, Mercedes also got their uh, compliance. So um, we recruited three vehicles. Our, our plan was to recruit based on technology, not based on manufacturer. So you, you must have heard um, Dan uh, talk about the technologies. One was the Lean Knox trap, um, and the other is uh, what is called, we call it as the <coughs> selective catalytic reduction. In short, we call it SCR. Um, Lean Knox trap is, um, was at that point offered only by a Volkswagen Jetta. Um, and the SCR was offered by everybody else. You know, it, it was actually uh, kind of perfected by Mercedes and their Bluetech technology. They, they call it their Bluetech system. Uh, so uh, BMW, Mercedes, and uh, all the Audi series had the SCR technology. So, I mean, procuring the Jetta was a no-brainer because that was the only uh, vehicle that had that uh, technology in it. So the SCR vehicles, we had, uh, you know, the other choices, but then we ended up uh, picking a Passat because uh, we were able to, you know, find a person who was about to sell his Passat and we kind of convinced him said, saying that, you know, we're going to give you some money, which is, which is going to, you know, cut your depreciation off and he was all happy about it. He made $4,000 out of it. And he gave us the vehicle and then we found a uh, exotic car rental place that gave us the BMW for, you know, another $600 per day rental. So, um, so when we tested these vehicles, there's, you know, it's, it's a small budget, uh, it's a small vehicle set so that things can be uh, wrong, that, you know, we picked the wrong vehicle, you know, that we, and it, it'll be really bad if we finish the study and then, you know, if, such as this case, you know, when we see high emissions, and then the project sponsor is going to come to us and ask, you know, can you guys explain why this vehicle is high in emissions? And, uh, you know, when we do these real-world emissions, there are so much of uh, parameters and factors that can affect the vehicle emissions. Um, it is always better to have a baseline, you know, just to cover, cover our bases and, you know, have, give a proper explanation. I mean, we are not really comfortable saying that we don't know, you know, because, you know, that's what we get paid for, to find out what is going on. Um, so we did this baseline, so that's when California Air Resources Board came in, you know, that, that was again by chance. So when California Air Resources Board came in, they said, oh, you, can, you guys can use all our resources, you know, we're giving you all our dyno time and everything, and we can do the baseline. If not for the baseline study, none of this would have been possible, because we would have just concluded the study saying it's variation in real world conditions, you know, traffic and such that causes these engines to um, work or be high in, uh, in, um, in emissions. Or we would have gone back and spent another fifty thousand dollars testing three more cars to make sure that we had a you know had a comparison and make sure that it is not just one vehicle that we tested was wrong. So the uh, when when the vehicles were on the chassis dynamometer, another thing is you know I think even PBS got it wrong. It is not a smog test that they cheated. You know, it's smog tests are easy uh, tests. These, these are nothing. Um, the 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 test that well I'm not supposed to say they are cheated according to our RPR. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not supposed to use those words. Um, the, the emissions that they, uh, the, the defeat devices they placed um, was not for smog check. I mean, if you take these cars for a smog check, it will still pass. Because the smog checks aren't as sophisticated and it's not, it's not a regulatory uh, process. So um, when we put this on, a, it's, a, it's a chassis dyno where, you know, you, you, you strap the vehicle on rollers and vehicles run on the rollers, uh, you know, the driver is going to see some traces. It's like a simulator pretty much, and he's going to drive it on this, on this dyno, and, um, you know, the emissions equipment are connected. Um, so we do a couple of things when we put the vehicle on the dyno. For example, most of these vehicles, you know, if it's a rear-wheel drive or a front-wheel drive, um, you know, only the driven wheels are on the on the on the roller if it's not a four-wheel drive car, and um, you know, you the, the vehicle would usually complain that you know two sets of uh, two sets of uh, one axle is not moving and the other is moving. It, it it kind of thinks it's a it's a slip on the road, and you know, for safety reasons, it doesn't allow you to operate. So you got to disable the ABS, you got to disable the traction control, and then uh, there are you know some of these cars have adaptive steering. You know, they it knows the steering position. 
So it tracks, you know, the vehicle's moving for a long time, but there's no steering action. You know, these, these things come up. And um, these, are, these are what they call as defeat devices. When they say defeat devices, there is no real device in it. I mean, it is just what factors that the car senses to, to conclude that it's being emissions tested. And these are uh, classic examples. Like Cadillac, um, when they wanted to bypass their uh, fuel economy uh, uh, um, standards, uh, not, not the fuel economy, their smog uh, 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 test 10 years back, they used the hood pin hood pin switch. Because when, you, when you're when you on the dyno, you know, you don't have enough airflow through the, uh, through the engine. Usually what they do is uh, they open the hood and they put a fan to blow across the, uh, the engine. And Cadillac used that as the, as the mechanism, as the defeat mechanism. They, they, they knew that you wouldn't go with your hood <coughs> open on the highway. So you know, that was their defeat device. So you know, they, they, that is very you know, low level defeat devices. You, uh, once the electronic sophistication came in, I mean, the defeat devices, you, 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 it's not even uh, uh, visible. It's not, it cannot be felt while driving. If you drive it on the dyno, if you take it onto the road, there won't be any performance difference. Okay, it'll be, it'll be perfect. So, um, so, so after we finished the dyno uh, so you, testing, uh, you yeah. bypassed the ODB2 port. I'm sorry. Did you your your device bypass the ODB2 port? Uh no, no, it wouldn't. See so the so the, the 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 OBD port. We 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 track the OBD port, the communication through the OBD port. That's part of the test protocol. Um, so the device is actually uh, fitted to the tailpipe, and it it also reads into the OBD port. So you, you know, but the OBD port tells you really nothing. I mean, it tells you what they want you to listen to pretty much um, and um, so once we finished the testing I remember my colleague who did the testing in California resources board and he used to be texting he's like okay these vehicles are really clean on these dinos and, and, and you know knowing what these technologies were capable of we knew this was true because we, we see these technologies in heavy duty trucks and they are extremely clean and then you know I joined him for the on-road work and we go on the road and we never see these emissions drop off. You know, it's always hovering above a certain limit, which we knew was not was not in in level with what the certification was. But of course, when you got to realize when you're on the road, you don't expect to to see the same emissions performance as on the dyno because dynos are controlled studies. If you're sitting in the traffic for like a couple of hours, you do not expect the vehicle to be low on emissions. I mean, the manufacturers are not required to do, uh, to comply with the emissions like throughout the, throughout the operating range. You know, they have a very specific task at hand. They are given the cycle, they're like, okay, this is the cycle that you guys have to uh, pass on and they can pass on. This is not illegal, you know. The, the part that became illegal over here was the company recognizing that it is going into a admissions test. If the company had simply said, you know, I know what are the operating points that are going to be hit during an admissions test procedure, and they made the vehicle clean in that operating region, and they said, okay, I'm not going to worry about the rest of the part, that's perfectly okay. But you cannot go into a test knowing that, okay, I'm, I know that I'm going to be on the test, and then uh, I'm going to be on its best behavior. So what, what I'm saying is, if you, if you go out on the road, like a, f a flat stretch of road, and you drive the exact same cycle that you are on the dyno, you should get the same number as on the dyno. If you take a Volkswagen a Passat or a TDI and do it, you will not get the same number. So that is where the, the, uh, the, the cheating part comes in. And uh, when we took the, uh, the vehicle out on the road and we, when we saw these emissions, um, obviously, uh, you know, being in this business, we cannot come to a conclusion immediately. Um, and you know, there are always uh, a lot of confidential legal agreements that go on between the regulators and the manufacturers. Uh, these, are not, um, these are not public information at all. So um, the, the, the real, uh, the people who can, who can actually enforce this or come up with a real story is the regulators themselves. So we kind of turned in the data to them and, um, and they were able to push the manufacturer to pretty much admitting a year and a half later because they had to do a, you know, a pretty comprehensive study um, to, to kind of uh, corner them into a position where they said, yes, we did use a, um, use a defeat uh, uh, device. But um, you know the question is why didn't the regulators pick it up in the first uh, first uh, uh, place? Um, the, the studies of these kinds are not um, common because it, it involves a lot of time, a lot of personnel. So for a regulatory board, it is not 
common for them to undertake a study like this because there are so many models out there, so many manufacturers out there, <coughs> it is impossible for them to you know, pick vehicles and start doing these real world tests. And you have to have a very, very comprehensive set of data before you, you, know, you, you approach a manufacturer saying that, okay, you guys are doing something, uh, something wrong. Mm -hmm. And I think during the course of these, these events, Volkswagen had a couple of uh, opportunities to fix it for me. They, they, it didn't have to go to this extent. Um, in December 2014, um, they issued a voluntary recall. So at that point of time, we thought, okay, that is the highest point you know, of our achievement. You know, we said, okay, we actually helped with a, with a recall of, of a manufacturer. And that was close to 16,000 <coughs> vehicles. You know, they, because at that point, they identified only the vehicle model years that we tested were affected, and, uh, which was about 16,000 vehicles. And they said, you know, they're going to issue a, a voluntary recall to fix it. Uh, but from what I heard, even after the promised fix, when uh, the regulators pulled those vehicles back in and they tested it, they found the fix wasn't, um, didn't do the job. I'm guessing they never did the fix because at, the, at that point they probably would have known that something is wrong with their, uh, with their calibration. And uh, I think again, with the, uh, I think at that point the regulators kind of stepped it up and tested different models, different year, model year, and they found emissions uh, excursions from 20, 2009 to 2015 for over 10 models. So that's why it's about 11 million vehicles now. So from 16,000 it went to 11 million, and about half a million in the US. OK, so here's how the rest of the class is going to go. You guys are going to divide up into the six groups you have earlier. Your group is going to come up with two questions that you would like to ask Arvind. The strategy behind that is that after we get through the questions with Arvind, because he's a very busy man and he's wanted across the United States at many different places. Then your group will make a statement to the press. You will choose who will be your press agent and your public relations agent and you will be representing Volkswagen. So the information he has just given you and then the two questions that you come up with with your groups will be 12 questions asked. We'll give you five minutes with your group to come up with those two questions. Are we going to hear everyone else's questions being asked and the answers? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Okay. Okay. Are we allowed to collaborate on the two questions each team is to ask? Yes. So, so when so you get together with your group, those I don't know who's in your group or how many people's in your group, <laughs> but you come to a consensus on what two questions do you think is going to best prepare you to make that statement. <laughs> I'll give right. you five minutes. I have first question. So blue one, blue one, your two questions please, blue one. Um, our, our first question is, can it even be fixed? Yes. Um, it's, um, I wouldn't say it's a simple, okay, technically it's a simple fix because um, it's uh, reflashing the ECU to the, uh, to the correct format. But then it leads to the, I don't know if that's going to be a second question, but then it, it goes back to the question of why they did it. Because if, um, because it has to, the, the fix has to answer the question of why they did it in the first place. Because they can just go ahead and reflash it. And uh, you know they can make everything right, but then if it was if this if, if this thing was put in place for a specific reason, let's say fuel economy, that's the popular theory. Um, it could take a fuel economy hit, and uh, you know uh, as a as a consumer, you were promised 41 miles per gallon, you might not get it. So they obviously have to address that. So it's an easy fix, but from from Volkswagen's perspective, they have to do a lot of testing to make sure that the after the fix, the car is in the same performance standards as it was advertised earlier. Uh, why do you think they did it? Um, OK. So um, fuel economy, is, as I said, is the most uh, popular uh, uh, criteria. But uh, some of our data show that it is not fuel economy. Uh, 
that we haven't published it yet, but since it's all double DVD, I can share it. Um, the reason being, um, fuel, uh, carbon dioxide emissions are indicative of fuel economy, and we did not see a, a remarkable change in CO2 emissions from the dyno, from the control study, to the road. So um, I would say it's um, related to cost, because um, making a vehicle to um, stringent emission standards requires uh, advanced catalyst and after, after treatments and even the, even the engine design has to be made more robust so that it can take the demands of meeting the emission standards. Um, that means the cost of the engine is going to uh, increase. And if you look at Volkswagen, they are the most least priced uh, diesel vehicle. If you look at BMW, they are averaging about 55,000. Mercedes around the same range. And their Audi range is also in that uh, in that uh, region. Audi is probably not that expensive. But again, there is a. it has to be either a cost-related uh, um, criteria, or they saw a repeated failure of certain components when they tried to meet emissions. And you know how you, I think many people in, in engineering, corporate engineering, you know how you know you guys are faced with deadlines, and you know you have to roll the product out in a certain period of time, and then you know it kind of comes to the question of you know can we get this out, um, you know, into the market by just going through this method of you know just. Let's just focus on getting the emissions done on the dyno, and then on the road, nobody's going to check. You know, let's just go to a conservative emission strategy that's going to keep the life of the parts. So those are the two things that I would say uh, was their aim. Thanks. All right. Thank you. So let's. Do you guys want to say with the blue side or go to the gold side? Great question, Steph. Great question. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, let's go with gold one then, please. <laughs> gold one, the representative. That's me. So it's, uh, questions is all on the same line. Would you have any idea what the what the impact to the MPG would be is if, if Volkswagen would install an SCR system to meet the demand of the EPA regulations? Okay, um, I think you're kind of confusing two uh, two technologies together. Okay, if um, the Jetta has a lean NOx trap, so it's right. very difficult for them to remove that and put an SCR system in. Okay, the Passat had an SCR system in it and it still didn't do well. Okay. So okay, but the SCRs theoretically are extremely efficient in cutting down NOx. But the problem, I think I forgot to mention this in your question. For an SCR vehicle, there is an added consumable. Does anybody know what that added consumable is? Urea. Urea. Not many people even know there's a separate tank in the car. It's a urea tank. The person that we got the car from didn't even know this tank existed. You know, because we went and asked him, like, okay, we, because we want, we want to make sure that we are getting the right vehicle, we asked him, do you know where the tank is? He's like, what tank? So it's hidden at the, the trunk of the vehicle. It's a small tank. The way the manufacturers try to do is they don't want to burden the customer with another fluid fill-up. So what they do is they try to uh, time it with uh, oil change. Most German cars have like a 10,000 mile oil change. I think most cars now do. So um, con conservation of that fluid is another um, uh, important criteria because you don't want um, a customer to, um, you know, you don't want the vehicle to prompt the customer to fill up urea like five, every 2,000 miles or 5,000 uh, 5, miles. But going back to your um, question, um, we, as I said, we did not find any significant differences in fuel consumption between the, the dyno and uh, the, uh, the on-road. But if they were to fix it, and let's, let's assume that it was a, a cost-based um, criteria that they, they kind of circumvented the this emissions standards. So they'll have to be a little bit aggressive in their, um, in their emissions control strategy. And the rule of thumb is whenever you try to be aggressive in your emissions control strategy, you will take a hit on the mileage. So that's where I think their creativeness or their engineering supremacy is going to come into play of how they're going to fix it as well as keep the mileage that you know, everybody's so happy about in the TDI. So there are estimations on what that the MPG deduction would be? Um, I, I would say um, the levels that they are at, you would actually, you would at least see a 10 to 15 percent drop. At the levels that they are, you know, they are about 10 to 35 times higher and uh, I think the SCR was 35 to 40. Uh, getting, uh, getting the SCR to work uh, to be compliant without fuel or mileage is very easy. That's that's no brainer for them. 
they have to just be aggressive in their urea, but then they, you will go to probably fill urea every 5,000 miles instead of 10,000 miles, but I think they can cover that. That's not a big deal for them. Okay, that, I'm going to take that as your two. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> so now let's go to blue two. Okay, uh, so from an ethical <coughs> standpoint, would you purchase a diesel based off the studies you've done with the Jetta and I guess the uh, Volkswagen? Yeah, I think this, this, these events have kind of uh, shed a bad light on diesel. It's, it's become like a diesel versus a gasoline uh, debate. Uh, I think it's, um, it's not the case. And frankly, you know, they're, 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 they're commercials about clean, clean diesel. I mean, I don't, uh, you know, that's, that's, that comes from the, the general thought that diesels are, are, are dirty and, and that's why they put that commotion in because you don't say clean gasoline vehicle anywhere. You know, you, everybody just assumes gasoline is clean. Um, but yes, I would, I would always, prefer a diesel. Uh, I don't own a diesel because uh, there is no manual transmission in a diesel. I would like to drive manual transmission cars. That's the reason why I didn't buy a diesel. But um, yes, I would buy a diesel because my research has been predominantly with diesel. And we know from a, from a technology standpoint what it is capable of. Um, in some parts of the world, there is a significant difference in fuel price between diesel and gasoline. You know, diesel is a very low price. In the U.S., um, you know, there is still not that uh, that that difference. But then diesel gives you some some advantages. It's a very robust engine platform. You know, it, it's just long. Uh, it, I think the the engine will probably outlive the chassis. You know, that kind of uh, 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 features that it has. Yes, diesel is. I think diesel still has uh, has life. Okay, and then what would you expect Volkswagen to do to fix the relationship that's kind of been damaged across the U.S.? Uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's your, your guy's ballpark. I'm just an engineer. <laughs> you ask me how to fix it, maybe I'll tell you. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. So then we'll go over to Gold 2. Representative for Gold 2. Uh, that's us. All right. Um, could you begin to estimate what the environmental damage has been from having uh, vehicles on the roads for the last seven years that exceeded the emission standards? That's a really good question. Um, that is part of our work now. So uh, what we have done is um, the way they, the way I will tell you how we estimate it, but we don't have the numbers yet. Um, this is of specific interest for California because you know they are what we call as a, a non-attainment state. Their ozone levels are above um, the, uh, the U.S. EPA stipulated standard. So U.S. EPA standard is uh, 70 parts per, per billion, and uh, California is exceeding it. And they got another couple of years to um, achieve this, uh, this standard, otherwise they're gonna face economic sanctions. So um, California is, is, is more concerned about what the economic, uh, sorry, environmental damage the vehicles have done. So what they are doing is they have found that um, there's about 50,000 vehicles operational mm -hmm. in California. They're using the numbers uh, provided by WD in, from, from the real world testing. And um, they are working with their uh, DMV to find what the vehicle miles traveled are for each of these vehicles. <coughs> and then they'll, give a, they'll get an estimated uh, oxides of nitrogen uh, burden uh, in, into the atmosphere. And then that will translate to um, the, uh, the ozone forming potential, because in the end, it's ozone forming. I mean, I don't, the, the, again, the, when, when, we, when we buy a vehicle, I'm not sure how many of you guys were, um, are familiar with oxides of nitrogen and the pollutant, especially for diesel, you know, it's always soot, you know, because that's the most visible thing we are always concerned about. There are so many things that our eyes cannot see which are more harmful than soot. So um, oxides of nitrogen is, is one of them, and that's the most regulated um, component in, in, in the U.S. And uh, a lot of debate has been going on uh, with this next question, but uh, from your perspective, at what level of management do you think the decision was made to implement the defect device? Yeah, that's another good question too. Um, from um, from my, um, my experience with ma working with uh, manufacturers, being in some engine development teams, um, the decision making doesn't go too far up in the chain. Okay. Um, the way most engine manufacturers uh, work is, okay, they start off on a on a on an engine model, and um, they they have customer goals that they got to meet, you know, fuel economy and stuff. 
the emissions department of that is really small. When you consider the entire engine development process, the emissions department is really small. And the emissions department probably faces the biggest problem because um, you know they'll come up with these strategies that reduce emission, but it is no way going to help the customers out. So they are always under this pressure. You know, it's like if you, if you consider the management hierarchy, there'll be like a you know there'll be like a team leader for for this engine. And he gets this instruction from above saying, you know, these are the performance goals this engine meets. And the guys are on top. They don't really care what this group of engineers do to meet those performance goals. And then these group of engineers sit, sit together and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. So in that aspect, sometimes, you know, I've, I, I kind of agree with, you know, the CEO who sat down saying he doesn't know. Probably doesn't know. Because he gave the order to build an engine that formed these these confines to these performance goals. He doesn't really care how they get to that standard. Thank you. Good questions. All right, so then our last two groups, I think we have blue three. See, the, uh, the, uh, if you consider the outside pressure, the outside pressure is the emissions regulations uh, uh, itself and, um, and, um, and a competition with, with other manufacturers. That's another uh, important uh, aspect. Because uh, if you look at, again, you know, if you look at uh, the, the diesel uh, car segment in the U.S., you know, if you look at uh, uh, Europe and even India, there are many manufacturers you know, who make... Uh, who make diesel cars, but in in, in, in uh, U.S. there's a very small group, and there is a huge division between uh, luxury segment and then you know, there's this economic uh, uh, segment. And I think the other pressure is to make a cheap diesel car. I mean, diesel cars, even the cheapest version, is about five thousand to six thousand dollars more than a gasoline car. You know, the the, the lowest price, like a Jetta or a, a Passat, is still pretty expensive. Uh, but I think that's another. Uh, uh, motivation, I would say, because uh, I read an interesting article. In 2009, um, Volkswagen was the third largest car manufacturer. In 2013, they became the world's largest car manufacturer. So. And then, uh, our second question was, you mentioned that you got a lot of these cars that you were testing from used dealerships. So we were wondering if the mileage on some of these used cars maybe would affect the readings from the emissions if there was certain yeah, I mean that's that's a good question too because uh, I mean that that goes into our vehicle recruitment process as we would say we would we would have to pick uh, um, mileages that are that we know what we okay what we call as uh, there is something we call as break-in period so every vehicle has to go through a break-in period before which we think we we think that the emissions have kind of flattened out it's going to be repeatable and then there's a period where it starts to drop off because of engine deterioration. Um, on, a, on a passenger car, <clears throat> 50,000 miles is probably a point where it starts, the emission starts uh, increasing and deterioration kicks in. Um, 4,000 to 5,000 miles is the braking period. So we try to get our vehicles in that, uh, in that window. The Passat was about 20,000 miles, which is actually perfect, you know, and uh, the Jetta was again the same, same thing. So. Thank you. Good question. All right, now our last two questions, and I just want to remind you, after we give you this, these two questions, the answers to these two questions, and you guys will go back to your groups, then you're going to elect a representative, you probably know, already know who it is, and then we're going to actually come up to the podium and make the statement. We're going to uh, video record this, and then uh, Arvin and I will try to ask questions afterwards and act as the press corps. All right, the last two questions from Gold 3. Um. The question I had is, since you've been on engine development teams, and so you have that perspective of it, and it sounds like this was a problem that may have occurred somewhere on the on the design end. <laughs> Do you think, in your opinion, that there is a undue pressure to on on these guys, like on a, like I don't know the product life cycle every year they have a new model, like to meet these standards? Like, are, like are we pushing the standards too fast, too high, which is kind of putting the pressure on the engineers? 
and the designers to kind of compromise on uh, apparently on their ethics on, on, the, on this end? I think the pressure from being competitive is more than the standards moving faster. Okay. Because the car, the passenger car industry is highly competitive. You know, models keep rolling out every year, new features <coughs> coming every year. Um, and, the, and the fuel economy needs to get better and better. I think that that pressure is far more greater than the standards going up faster. Because the standards haven't really gone up that fast. I mean, when it goes up, when the standards are revised, they just take a huge leap. Okay. I mean, it might take them like 10 years to get the standard in, but then, you know, at 10 years later, you will be like, you know, it will go an order of magnitude lower. So and, uh, and then the manufacturer knows it. I mean, it's not like, you know, one day EPA is going to release a press release say, hey, from tomorrow on, this is the standard. The manufacturers are heavily involved in creation, creating the standard. So, from your perspective, Europe standard, <coughs> U.S. standard, and California standard, mm -hmm. would you think that, like, say the U.S., the middle, is more, like, kind of where it should be, or do you think California is, like, kind of pushing it, like, with their higher, the, the higher standards they have? Cal or do you think that's where it should be, like? California pushes most of the regulation because, um, you know, that the reason is, I mean, as I said, California has an air quality problem. Yeah. And manufacturers hate multiple regulations. You know, they want one unified regulation. You know, get away with this headache of U.S. regulation. Then I got to make another calibration for California regulations. So what they usually tend, or what California usually tend to do is they they try to force the regulation lower and lower, and then the U.S. EPA says, okay, let me might as well just do what they're doing, you know, lower it. But then you know it just kind of begs the question. You don't need an ultra clean vehicle running in Wyoming. No, that that the people living in Wyoming would say that. Did you guys run uh, biodiesel at all? And wouldn't you pass the emissions test running straight biodiesel? Um, the bio biodiesel has its uh, challenges because uh, the flexibility of fuel in a diesel car is not uh, that easy. Because uh, usually what happens is um, biodiesel tends to slightly increase NOx. So a car's um, electronic control has to recognize that biodiesel is in the tank. So it actually kind of becomes uh, uh, expensive in a way. Right now the approved biodiesel levels are what we call it as B5. So if only 5% of biodiesel most cars accept. Um, and the fuel systems, not all the fuel systems are, um, are um, capable of accepting uh, biodiesel. So if you look at the, uh, sometimes on the tank uh, gas uh, cap, you will see that, you know, don't put B20 or, or B30 and stuff like that. But yeah, biodiesel is not necessarily a solution for lower uh, emissions. It, it actually, you know, it, it can go completely wrong if you don't have the right uh, strategy, if you don't recognize uh, biodiesel. Same thing goes with uh, flex fuel vehicles, you know, ethanol blends and uh, gasoline. They have sophisticated fuel uh, fuel quality sensors that that kind of me measures what the percent level of ethanol is, and then the engine.